Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today I'm going to answer the simple question, why they them can't write superheroes. Now you'll notice I'm saying can't write superheroes. I'll admit that they can't write heroes to begin with, but I'm concentrating on specifically why they can't write superheroes. And yes, I'm being facetious tongue in cheek when I say they them can't write superheroes because I do not believe people can choose their own pronouns. So basically it's why people who believe that they can choose their own pronouns can't write superheroes. And I'm going to use as my example that prime superhero, that superhero who, if it wasn't for him, the rest of the superhero genre would not exist, at the very least in the capacity it does right now, and that superhero is Superman. But if you wish to see a comic book, a graphic novel, with actual superheroes, with heroic traits hearkening back to the ideas that really birth the genre, then you should check out my three graphic novels. The links for those are in the description and in the pinned comment. There are two superhero graphic novels and one return to form for low fantasy sword and sorcery in the vein of Conan. As I said, these books concentrate on ideas like true heroism, virtue, death, honor, in the tried and true merit-based way that good stories should be told. And you're looking at some of the spectacular art from those in the background, so if any of that looks or sounds appealing to you at all, click on one of those links in the description and go on over and see if one of my graphic novels is for you. But back to my topic, and let's start at the very basis. As I said, I'm going to talk about why such people who believe they can choose their own pronouns cannot write superheroes. Not just heroes, but very specifically here, superheroes. So let's define first of all what a superhero is. Well, a superhero is someone who has superpowers, someone who has powers far beyond those of mortal men. And yes, I do understand that there are superheroes like Batman who technically don't have any powers, but quite honestly, he is still in effect a superhero because if you took a normal human being, one that exists in our world, and tried to put him through the ringer that Batman has been through, he'd be dead long and ever ago. Simply by virtue of the massive combination of blows he receives almost every issue. So I would claim that yes, that suspension of disbelief for this normal human being to be able to live through such a pounding for characters like Batman is indeed the super part of their superhero moniker. So as characters that have power far beyond those of mortal men, what are they? Well, basically, as concerns the definition of power, they're demigods. And since we've defined the super part of the superhero, let's go and define what the hero part of hero is once again. And I suppose at the same time, defining in a roundabout way what a story is, because we're talking about superhero stories. Well, for those two things, if you don't know by now, I go back to the ancient definition, the tried, tested, and true definition of both what a story is and what a hero is that comes out of Aristotle, who was writing 2,400 years ago, basing his analysis off not only logic, but also off of stories that preceded him by 800 years. And so those definitions, I would say, existed for more than 3,000 years and were carried straight on right up until the present day. So first off, I would say it doesn't matter if people try to redefine what a story is or what a hero is today, even if it was just concentrating on the force of history, that 3000 year old still in use definition of hero and story would steamroll over any attempts to change either of those things. But I would say on top of that, his definitions, A, are based on logic, which B is based on reality, the reality of human nature. And the reality of human nature that will always bring us back to his definitions, no matter how much people try to change them, is that a story is a reflection of reality, and a hero is someone who is more virtuous than the common man. Or, as I usually put it, a hero is someone who is a paragon of virtue. And as Aristotle describes it in his book called The Poetics, you cannot have a hero to try to force a hero into a story who is less virtuous than the common man. Less virtuous, by the way, would mean someone who has vice, who is more vice-ridden than the common man, someone who is vicious. And why can't you do that? Well, he said you can't do that because people reading the story, listening to the story, watching the story, will find it offensive. Now, I usually get someone in the comments pushing back against that statement when I make it, but just think for a second about the following. 
First off, I understand that some people might have what I suppose you could qualify as a perverse enjoyment of seeing a villain being portrayed as a hero. Just think about your own life for a second. Think about, for example, politicians, people who have lots of power. Do you think that most politicians deserve that power? Do you think any politicians deserve that power that they have? The answer to that question is most likely a resounding no in one form or another. And those forms would be various ideas like, no, they're not good enough people to have that kind of power, i.e. they're not virtuous enough to have that power. Or, why should they have that power and not me? Why should they have that power and not someone else? They don't deserve it. And I would say we have that kind of mindset today within our viewing of politics because politics no longer has the firm foundation of virtue. That is to say, no longer has even the firm foundation of reality that supports virtue and creates virtue. Because laws used to be and are supposed to be as they are established in our various forms of government within Western civilization based upon natural law. That is to say, law that emanates from the ends of a human being, the natural ends, where a human being is supposed to find fulfillment, happiness, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as such, if they were a pursuit of those lofty goals, which are innate within human beings, the people appointed to deal with such conditions of the human being should not themselves be taking up that power as individuals, but as representatives of that reality, serving that reality, serving that greater ideal and there would be much less of the individual within the governing structure, no matter what governing structure you have. So if we hearken back to those old ideas, you would say, no, they don't deserve it to begin with. They're just dealing with greater forces, trying as best as possible through human knowledge to implement the pursuit of what naturally flows in the pursuit of human good, human happiness. So again, going back to those old ideas, which our civilizations are based on, it would remove the individual from actually being able to access power beyond the scope of the virtue that they are possessing as a governing body. And to give a very brief example of all of that, most of you listening to me would have a form of government wherein there is a house of some kind, whether it be a house of commons or a senate or a house of representatives, etc. And many of those houses still have a tradition. The tradition is that when they elect a speaker from among their members, that speaker is supposed to refuse in some way. He's supposed to deny that he has the ability to fulfill that job, to say, I'm not good enough for that position. Why? Because that position is based around the idea that the individuals of that house are representatives of something greater. Representatives, say, of the voices of a multitude of people. And so the power that they exercise is in speaking itself on behalf of those multitudes of people. And the speaker of the house is the one who says, you can speak now, this is what you can say, this is what you cannot say. So he has ultimate power, as it were, over the ability of the members and through them the entire society to speak. And so he must deny that he has what it takes to be such a person, to wield such power. And in essence, that tradition, because that's all it is right now, but that tradition is to say that the most powerful among those members must also be humble. That indeed, the first act of his being speaker is to humbly deny that he can do the job is to humbly deny that power. But of course, we've gotten rid of all of that, and so you have people now simply gaining power for power's sake, exercising power for power's sake, and most of us look at politicians and go, no, no politician deserves actual power beyond a normal citizen. Why do they have it? And that may be lesser or greater within your mind, but it's probably still there. And it harkens back, again, to that reality of how human beings exist and what our laws are based upon. And that's the exact same reality that 
Aristotle is tapping into when he says that if you have a story where you have a quote-unquote hero who is not actually virtuous but is someone who is vice-ridden, that is to say even more vice-ridden than the common man, then that's going to be offensive. Offensive to what? Offensive to who? Well, offensive to the innate, natural inclinations of every human being. And that's just a big old long way of saying that, yes, some people may subvert those natural inclinations, but they're still natural inclinations. All right, so with all of that out of the way, let's look at Superman for a little bit. The question arises, if you have a hero, someone who is the protagonist of your story, and they have immense power, like Superman, how do you write them in a way that serves not only the correct definition, the logical definition of a story, but also the correct and logical definition of what a hero is. Well, there's a basic, simple equation for that entire thing. Again, taking Superman as our example, the example of an overpowered individual. If you're going to write an overpowered individual, and superheroes are, since they are, in effect, demigods, in one form or another, overpowered, the more power you give the character, the more humble they have to be if you wish your reader to have a natural inclination to feed into the suspension of disbelief that will allow them to say to themselves, yes, this individual does deserve that power. And I think for Superman, this was expressed best by someone who was one of the longest running writers for Superman, certainly if you count all the different iterations that he worked on. And that person is Jim Shooter. Jim Shooter started writing Superman when he was, what, 13 years old? Cut his teeth on writing that character and wrote that character again in various iterations within the Superman books, within Legion of Superheroes, etc., etc., for many years, making his entire career around creating comic books and superhero comic books in particular. And Jim Shooter has said in interviews, in panels, at comic cons where he has spoken, the way that you write Superman is as follows. He says, you have current writers, and he's talking about this for a long time now, you have writers who try to write Superman by making him human in the fact that they give him flaws. He says, that's not how you write Superman. He says that Superman is Sir Galahad. And if you have a writer who cannot write Superman as Sir Galahad, then get yourself a new writer. So, in order to explore this character of Superman, let's explore for a minute the character of Sir Galahad. Sir Galahad was a knight of the round table, the only knight of the round table who was able to complete the quest of the Holy Grail. And why was he able to do so? Because he was Sir Galahad the Pure. Sir Galahad's father, Sir Lancelot, was supposed to be able to actually get to the Holy Grail because he was the greatest of King Arthur's knights, but he wasn't able to. Why? Because he was controlled in an inordinate way by his passion. That is to say, he had a character flaw. He had vice that kept him from entering into the presence of that holy thing, which is the Holy Grail. That vice of being controlled by his passions in most iterations of the legend led to the actual birth of Sir Galahad because Sir Lancelot slept with the wife of his king, which would be Lady Guinevere. But Sir Galahad had no such character flaw. Sir Galahad, who was raised by nuns, raised to be a knight from the very moment he was born, and to be not a knight, but the greatest knight, who was to take up that empty seat around the round table, that seat which, when other knights tried to take it up, they were swallowed up by the earth itself, he was able to do so because he was Sir Galahad the Pure. And that purity was expressed in his humility. The story goes on about him receiving visions from Joseph of Arimathea as to what he must do in order to actually reach the destination of the Holy Grail, and it is his humble service to those instructions that allows him to do so. And so this is what Superman is supposed to be. Superman is allowed in the reader's mind to possess such awesome power because he is Sir Galahad, because he is humble. And if you take away that humility, both for him and for any other overpowered individual, the less and less your audience is going to accept him, really even up to the point where we have a Superman right now that most people reject. 
And what is, pray tell, humility? Well, let's go back to the etymology of the word. Humility actually means being close to the earth. It comes from the Latin humus, which is the earth. And so if you want to take the etymological origins of that word and translate it into an idiom that we use today, a humble person is a down-to-earth person. In so much as a down-to-earth person is someone who is close to the earth. That is to say, someone who understands the natural processes of the things around him. Or to put it another way, someone who is humble, looks around them, see what naturally is occurring according to reality, and accepts a submission to those things that are happening around him. To say, this happens despite anything I think, want, feel, it doesn't matter. It's reality, I accept it. And this ties right back into the definition of hero that, as I said, has run through our civilization for thousands of years. The definition of a hero being a paragon of virtue. Because those virtues are, as I always say, four in number and have a very specific pattern. They are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. But the thing is, in order to even get to, as Aristotle explains, those virtues, First, you must have something else, and that is right reason. Or to put it in more layman's terms, your reason in accord with reality. That is to say, you look around you at reality and you say, I submit my reason itself to the rules of reality around me. And that submission is humility. And so that harkens back, again, to Aristotle's definition of a hero, to what Superman is, to what super beings are in superhero universes to the very idea that I was talking about at the first of whether or not you can look at a politician and say, yes, they deserve this position. It is the key point of humility. If any or all of those individuals were humble enough to say, I serve, by showing that they serve reality itself, what exists, what naturally is, then you would say, yeah, I guess so. Maybe not so much for the politicians, but that's because of our jaded times, I would say. Deservedly jaded times. But anyway. But to continue the discussion, if we are to truly answer the question of why someone who thinks they can choose their own pronouns can't write a superhero, first we must look at humility and its opposite. And what is the opposite of humility? Well, the opposite of humility is pride. And pride for Christianity for the last 2,000 years, and even prior to that with the ancient Greeks, is considered the greatest of evils. Within Christianity, not only does evil exist within the world because one creature, who was the devil, brought it into existence because he was proud, but also if you look at something simple like the seven deadly sins, the first and capital of those sins is pride. Pride is considered the mother of all sins. That is to say, you cannot commit any other sin without first committing the sin of pride. And why? And how does this make it the opposite of humility? Well, because pride is a person saying that I see reality around me. I know what it says, but I know better than reality. I know better than the truth. And that's the exact same definition that Plato gives to the greatest evil. He says the greatest evil is a love of self which encourages the individual to say what is mine and me are more important than what is true. He is describing nothing else with this greatest evil than pride. And let's tug on that thread for just a moment. Because Plato is the teacher of Aristotle. He is one of the intellectual pillars upon which all of Western civilization is built. And that statement he makes about the greatest evil comes about midway point in chapter 5 of his book called The Laws. The Laws is his seminal work. The seminal chapter is chapter 5. In it, he lays down the principles upon which a, as close to as possible, perfect society would look like within existence. He starts off by saying, all of the laws which this society is based on would be based upon the truth. Then he moves on to what every individual would have to make 
as a law unto themselves for their own actions in order to fit into such a society, which is to say the individual would orient themselves towards the truth. And then, when he finally gets to the end of all of that, about the midway point of that chapter, talking about the greatest evil, what does he then go on to talk about? He then goes on to talk about stories. And not only stories, but he talks about how all of that, that great society built on the truth, can be undermined by stories. Stories that are contrary to the truth. And what does he give for the prime example of a story that would undermine all of that? Well, he gives you the story of Ganymede. And for those who do not know the story, the story of Ganymede is the story of a young man who was exceedingly beautiful. Zeus was so struck by his beauty that he turned into an eagle and carried the young man away up into Olympus to be his cupbearer and at the same time to ravage the young man. By the way, neither Plato nor Aristotle were very keen on this part of Greek society that a lot of people today point back to and say, well, it was always that way. No. Plato says this kind of a story must be excised from a healthy society. Why? Because it is simply used by the people who tell it over and over again as an excuse to justify their own vices. Vices which are contrary to the natural use of a man and a woman. And again, he places it in this very specific crescendo of his ultimate work because he's describing how such things would undermine a society based on truth. And this goes a long way to answering our question because in all of the things that we've been discussing in Plato's covering of the story of Ganymede, of the story and origin of Sir Galahad, which starts out as the story of Sir Lancelot not being able to keep it in his pants, or the story of modern-day current Superman. What is the common thread through all of that? Well, the common thread through all of that is if you start thinking from below the belt, then you're going to think of yourself as much more important than you actually are. You're going to disregard humility and become prideful. And that pride is going to deny reality, deny what is true. Some of these certainly more than others, but that's the general common thread through all of these. And that's the general common thread that answers the question of why people who think they can choose their own pronouns cannot write a superhero. Because if you choose yourself a pronoun which says you're a different species than human being, then you are denying reality. If you choose a pronoun which is a plural to say that you are a plural rather than a singular, you are denying reality. If you choose a pronoun which is opposite to the thing that you are because the opposite of male is female and the opposite of female is male, then you are denying reality. And if you go along with this entire thing and say that, yeah, it's okay for certain people to choose their own pronouns because they get to choose the reality of their own existence, then you are denying reality. You are denying the reality, the most simple reality there is, the basic first rule of logic itself, which is a thing is what it is. And if you're a person who cannot understand the simple continuity of how you as an individual actually exist, then to try to understand and then replicate the complexities of a story, a true story with a true hero, you will fail miserably. Again, nowhere is this more evident than the stories of Superman right now. As Richard Meyer over at Comics Matter likes to say over and over again, you look at this character of Superman, this character who has the moniker, the last son of Krypton. Why is he given that moniker? What is he within those stories? Well, he is the last son. He is the last survivor. And yes, I know there are exceptions within the story, but he's supposed to be the last survivor of this entire civilization of people. And their hopes and dreams were placed on him which, by the way, is one of the other ancient definitions of a hero, a paragon, a virtue that people 
place their hopes and dreams on, those hopes and dreams for this character were placed squarely on his shoulders so that he could continue the civilization of Krypton by what? By having children who have children. He would become, in effect, the Adam for his civilization so that it could continue. And what happens within these stories now? He has a child, his only child, who will never reproduce. This makes absolutely no sense according to the entire narrative of the story of Superman. And why? Well, because the people who write Superman right now have to celebrate what? Well, they have to celebrate pride. And that pride goes hand in hand with their I get to choose my own pronouns mindset. And so not only does that pride which swells up within them and which they celebrate destroy the humility needed for right reason, which destroys any concept of the traditional and really reality-based definition of hero, not only that, but it also especially destroys their ability to write a superhero. And why? Well, because these people cling to an ideology which says, first of all, there is no truth, there's only power. Everything in their ideology is boiled down to power politics. That is to say, everything in their estimation is calculated, even the so-called reality around you, by politics, by the interaction of people with other people. And the politics with the most power is the one that wins out in the end. And with such an ideology firmly fixed within their minds, they believe in the most prideful way that they deserve power, that they deserve to be the ones to define the reality for you, me, everyone. So, in essence, they fundamentally misunderstand how normal human beings naturally think about power because in their prideful denial of truth and reality, they are themselves prideful wielders of power, which makes them the least worthy to have it. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. And don't forget, there are two links in the description and the pinned comment for my three graphic novels. Novels that concentrate on the idea of true virtuous heroism. And if that appeals to you in any way, click on one of those links in the description and go on over and order yourself a copy of one of my graphic novels today. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.